Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here at the Hillside Club. My name is Arlene Baxter. I'm the vice president here, and it's my pleasure to be joined this evening for our presentation on plastic and the pandemic with Martin Bork, executive director of the Ecology Center. Martin and I were fortunate enough to collaborate exactly a year ago, the first Monday of July in 2019, when we did a presentation on the plastic crisis. It was a broader topic, and it was a different year. That night, we filled this hall more to, than capacity, talking about various aspects of the plastic crisis. Martin and his staff were here giving examples of what was recyclable and what wasn't. And we were inspired particularly by two things. One is the same as this year, which is we are part of the Plastic Free July Challenge, a challenge to people all over the world to reduce their use, especially of single-use plastic. But what has changed is this year, of course, we are here in an empty hall, just with our videographer, our wonderful president and manager, but no one else, and Martin and I are socially distanced. And we are addressing the other major thing that has changed in the world, notably the pandemic. That is the primary topic for this evening. I just want to mention a little bit of context and content. Of course, the topic of plastics is very, very broad. We won't be getting a lot into the issues of microplastics, so it's a very important one, and I'm tempted to do another presentation on just that topic. But for this evening, we're going to be focusing on the things that have changed over that last year. I'm going to show you now some photographs of one of the major things that all of us have experienced as a result of the pandemic. What you see in these photographs is something that we're seeing all over our communities, which is protective equipment that is not being thrown away, but simply tossed as well as thrown away in amazing quantities. Right outside my house, there are discarded gloves and masks all over the neighborhood. Gloves, like plastic bags, can appear to be jellyfish or other types of food for sea turtles, for example. The straps on masks can present entangling hazards. Over time, those products break down and add to the vast collections of microplastics in our seas, air, and food. And the irony is that while we produce and discard plastic to fight one public health crisis, we may be slowly contributing to another. Martin, how is, are you seeing changes in your industry after the pandemic? Thanks, Arlene. Um, it's great to be with you all tonight. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, at the Ecology Center, uh, where I'm the executive director, we do the curbside recycling for the city of Berkeley. So uh, we have eight trucks that go out every day and collect uh, different parts of the city each day of the week. And what we've seen in the, you know, since the pandemic started is a pretty significant uptick in the amount of recyclables that we're getting back uh, in our recycling yard. So because people are sheltering in place and they're using a lot more packaging and uh, they're ordering a lot of food delivery and they're getting a lot of online delivery uh, of their purchases, we're getting a lot, of, uh, a lot more disposable plastic um, and we're also getting a lot more uh, small cardboard packages. So we haven't seen a huge uptick in PPE in the recycling, although I'm sure there's some there. People largely have not tried to recycle masks and gloves and shields and smocks and that, that kind of stuff. And, and we just want to reiterate that none of that is recyclable. And we encourage you, if you're just using a mask regularly, that you use a reusable mask and a mask that you can wash and um, sanitize. But most of the PPE is, is disposable and either needs to go in the garbage can um, or if you're working in a medical facility, it need, probably needs to be handled as biomedical waste and, and treated as infectious waste. This is a good example of the kind of mask Martin was just talking about. They're very convenient. They are also plastic. But 
they are really not the best alternative for, as he mentioned, other than medical workers. And this is sort of a theme throughout our evening's presentation of the conflict between what is convenient versus what is more durable and more long lasting. So as opposed to a cloth mask that can be washed many, many, many times. So encourage you to, when you have the choices of the durable higher quality versus the consumable, choose the durable. So, which leads into another major change that we're seeing, which is about plastic bags. I'll just, as, as one example, a show and tell, one that even says, reduce, reuse, recycle. But then in the small print, it says, please return to a participating store for recycling. This could be used 125 times. Martin, do you want to talk about bags like this, which are a little firmer, as well as the resurgence of the, the lighter weight single-use bags? Mm -hmm. So just maybe by way of background, I should remind everyone that um, up until 2014, those bags, uh, the single-use disposable super lightweight bags were commonplace throughout the state. Hundreds of millions of them were used on an annual basis. They were clogging our storm drains. They were a huge problem for recycling because they gummed up all of our equipment. And they were not largely um, going unrecycled and so being dispersed into the environment and into our landfills. Many cities and counties had, um, you know, starting with the leadership of San Francisco in 2009, uh, banned those bags. Uh, 2009, we also piloted bag reduction strategy uh, at our farmer's markets here in Berkeley. And so we banned those plastic bags, the plastic carryout bags, and we put a charge on compostable or recyclable bags just to see what, how that would work in our farmer's markets. And we used that strategy uh, then to get a similar ordinance passed at the county level um, that Stop Waste, uh, our Waste Management Authority, took the lead on. Amazing work that they did. Um, but basically the idea was rather than asking the question paper or plastic, which we felt had always been the wrong question, um, you know, we felt that the solution is bring your own bag or the question should really be do you need a bag, um, which is now the question that checkers uh, typically ask. And so it really hasn't been that long that those bags have been out of circulation in California. In 2014, enough cities had adopted their own uh, bag, or counties had adopted their own bag reduction ordinances, and uh, the state legislature passed uh, a ban on single-use plastics, bags, carry-out bags, and a 10-cent charge on the disposable paper bags and required minimum recycled content in those. Now, that's where these larger, uh, that's where the bags that Arlene was just showing you. In, in that law, it allowed for a durable, reusable plastic bag. And it's a thicker bag, and it has to be engineered to um, be designed to be used at least 120 times. So that language is actually on every one of those bags, or by law should be. But good luck getting 120 uses out of those bags. Um, occasionally, Inadvertently, I end up with one of them, and you know, I maybe get 10 uses out of them, um, and you know, they are more durable than the old ones. Uh, but eventually, they're going to end up in, in the landfill, and that's not really the circular economy that we're after. With the pandemic, uh, the governor issued a stay on that law. So the law had two elements. It had a ban on the single-use disposable plastic bags, and it had a charge on the reusable bags. And so both of those things were temporarily suspended at the state level. And then many counties um, have sort of doubled, doubled down on that and included that in, in their orders around their safety protocols. And the reason for that largely was that they didn't want um, people bringing their own bags that might have the COVID virus on them into the supermarket and um, to have workers, uh, baggers and checkers handling them. There is not a lot of science that shows that contact surface um, contamination is actually a, a real vector for um, transmission of the disease and in fact um, plastic is one of the surfaces on which the disease can last the longest so bringing in a cloth bag or you know, a reusable paper bag or something else a, a, another bag doesn't seem like a, a real strong vector but you know at, in a abundance of caution 
Um, that was the order that was placed. That um, order is now, it was for 60 days. You know, the suspension is sunsetting. And so the old law um, goes back into effect. Uh, it'll probably take a minute for us to get back there. Our fear really was that we would lose sort of the cultural shift that had been largely successful statewide of getting people to remember to bring their own bags, to um, not take a bag when you don't need one, if you just have a couple things. And still today, if you run into that where you're finding those disposable plastic bags or um, they're not asking the question, do you need a bag and automatically bagging your stuff, you, know, you can easily just take your stuff and put it back in a shopping cart, take it to your car, load it in your bags at the shopping cart, or just you know say, I don't need a bag and just carry out the few things that you need. The new orders that are coming out from counties um, say that you can now bring your own, but that you can't place it on any surface. So you could hold a bag and then take the items and put it in, but you're not supposed to put it on the counter uh, where things are getting checked out. A number of restrictions on single-use plastics have been paused or rolled back as authorities scramble to fight this crisis. The pattern has prompted concern from organizations, including the World Bank, these measures have all been announced as temporary, but how long will they stick, fed by anxiety around health concerns? Driving that concern is a feeling among conservationists that the plastic industry is seizing its moment to capitalize on public health concerns by promoting the use of its products. Yeah, it's pretty egregious what the American Chemistry Council and the Food Packaging Institute and other industry advocates and lobbyists have been doing. They put a tremendous amount of pressure on the Trump administration trying to get uh, all the agencies, the FDA, the CDC, um, others to say that um, plastic is preferable, that disposable is preferable. They actually tried to get language that would um, make the advice or the guidance to restaurants when they reopen to use disposable foodware, even in restaurants that never have before. So it's been pretty egregious uh, and opportunistic moment for the plastic industry. Um, I think their efforts are so self-interested that they speak for themselves and uh, that people are smart enough to see through that. I also am encouraged by the dramatic outpouring of support um, by people, uh, everyday citizens on Twitter and on social media, going to the websites of some of these major brands, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Coke and & Pepsi, and just letting them know how you feel about their packaging. They are very sensitive to that. And so in spite of these sort of major lobbying plays that, that have been going on, there's also a, a counter movement that is still very strong. And, and uh, we hope that coming out of the pandemic, the tide won't have changed and uh, will continue to really dramatically reduce single-use disposable plastic. As Martin mentioned, <clears throat> all of these things are going to take a little bit of time. We've been living under new regulations to a degree that is unusual in our lifetimes and changing so quickly. Um, I'll just, as a, another sort of show and tell, thinking about bags that can be reused and are bringing in our own, um, this is a canvas bag. I just happen to think it's a lovely cause and a lovely graphic as well. But reminding, too, that our own carry bags can be washed and should be washed. Uh, it was a reminder to me that many different forms can be put in the laundry, can be sanitized. But for your own safety as well as others, do wash them occasionally. About that question that we hoped we wouldn't ever be asked again, paper or plastic, where the real answer should be, I don't need a bag, neither is the right answer. So since this all started, I too have been just asking people, please put my groceries back in the cart, and I'll take them back, load them up in my car, in my own bags. But it's another example of where we have to be mindful. We have to be aggressive consumers. And before the checkers start putting things into the bags, say, no, no, I don't need that. Ironically, you even need to say that at farmer's markets, where the default lately has become to put it into a, a bag. The other major change that we've looked at around plastics, of course, was the law here in Berkeley that mandated the use of consumables, compostables, 
and the ability to bring in our own foodware. And this might be a good time to listen to an interview that I conducted just a few days ago with my city council person, the city council person for a large part of North Berkeley here in California, uh, Sophie Hahn. Thank you so much, Sophie Hahn, for joining me in this conversation about plastic and the pandemic. Um, not only are you my own city council person for District 5, so a natural person to reach out to, but also you were so instrumental in the development of the ban on single-use plastics for Berkeley, along with our guest, Martin Bork. So I wonder if you can give me and our viewers a little bit of background about that and where we are now with that ordinance in light of our current world. Well, thank you so much, Arlene, and it's it's wonderful that you're doing these this little series, and I'm glad that we're able to focus on some of the issues that continue to be of importance to the city of Berkeley, even in light of, of the COVID crisis, and I would call it the Black Lives Matter opportunity, because I view that as a great opportunity for us to uh, make some, some very overdue strides forward in terms of racial justice. But uh, the environmental crisis is still with us. It has not left. That includes climate change and, of course, zero waste and plastics, which remain and may you know, be increasing as a problem for our environment. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to handle more than one crisis at once. So there was the, ba the ban on single-use plastics went into effect legally January 1st, but wasn't going to be fully implemented, not enforced for a year. So yes, it's a little bit complicated because the single-use foodware and litter reduction ordinance, it's phased in in three phases. The first phase was in March of 2019 when it was first passed. The second phase went effective January 1st of 2020. And there is um, an additional phase that goes into effect July 1, 2020. Not only was, was it phased, but for each phase, enforcement is one year after it's phased in. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea between this, behind this ordinance was for us to work in partnership with our food sector and move towards the elimination of throwaway plastics and ultimately of all throwaway foodware over time working together. So it's, it's not something that was intended to come down in a very uh, hard and difficult to manage way for our restaurants and for our food service. It, it's, a, it's a couple year partnership for us all to get there. So I, of course, the timing of this is such that it, it very much is intertwined with our management of the COVID crisis. So some elements of this are in effect, but were not yet being enforced already when COVID came. So you could say that we were a little bit in a gray zone. We were at a time where the requirements were in place, but there's no enforcement. So really the message I think is, you know, please try your best um, over this year to try and get there and be ready, a, you know, a year after the effective date, because at that time we really will be asking you to be in compliance. You mentioned that you'd seen various degrees of compliance and different reactions among restaurants. Maybe you could share that with our viewers. Yes, well, first of all, I just wanna say that our restaurant um, and all of our retail are struggling right now. It's, it's, it's been a terrible, terrible blow and they have been heroic, but it's very complicated. Uh, we are all very appreciative of those that have been able to be open for takeout. I think all of us uh, may be doing more cooking, but we also enjoy having some food that we didn't have to cook ourselves and enjoying some of the delicious offerings that the city of Berkeley has always provided. With the to-go, I have seen actually quite good compliance. Not perfect, but very good compliance with the requirement that all to-go foodware be compostable or reusable. On a couple of places where I've been ordering from, maybe five or six different places, have been providing virtually everything in compostable containers. One of the places I frequent is using a durable uh, plastic.
plastical reusable bowls, which I'm not loving, but they do comply. And then I have had a couple of times when the utensils and things were thrown into the bag without being asked, but they were compostable. It's not exactly to the letter, but I see a lot of compliance. I am delighted. When I think about the mountain of plastics that Berkeley could be creating right now with this new uh, required to go culture, I really shudder to think what this looks like in communities that do not have this kind of legislation. The piles of the mountains of plastic and styrofoam that must be being generated in other communities is, is really tragic. So I think we have this just in time. I don't see a lot of non-compliance, just a little tiny bit here and there at the edges. So all things considered with the struggles that our businesses are having in our restaurants, I, I really would applaud Berkeley restaurants for, for the high level of compliance that they're showing even in these difficult times. And do you think there is political wherewithal, community will to make this ordinance really enforceable in the year to come or years to come? I do. I mean, I, you know, I have a very full inbox. <laughs> since, since COVID, it's been fuller than ever. And um, people raise all kinds of concerns and there's a lot of stress and um, upset in the community, a lot of fear. And uh, the plastic bags and the plastic foodware is, is something, a topic that I have received a decent amount of email about. Most of it has been people unhappy or alarmed, for example, plastic bags in, in some of the supermarkets and things, and also reusable shopping bags and things. But I think that's going to turn around now. The state and Alameda County have recently provided very, very clear guidance that you can use your reusable bags. You cannot store employees to touch them. You would have to use them yourself, but they are very clearly allowed. And so hopefully we'll see over the next week or two, uh, we'll see that coming back. It takes a couple weeks after a rule changes for the information to filter uh, into the community and into our business community. But I, I, am, I think that we are, going to see that definitively change and the new habits will come back into place. Well, let's hope that your optimism is, is well-founded. I certainly, truly hope it is. have been taking my groceries and just putting them back into the, the grocery basket and then taking that um, outside and, and putting the groceries in my own uh, backpack if I'm walking or into bags in, in the back of my car if I drove to the market. So there, there have been ways to get around it all along. We would not have had the overwhelming support for the legislation in the first place, not only from our customers, but from our business sector, if it wasn't something that was very much in sync with Berkeley's values. Right. And you know, people have a lot to adjust to right now. I applaud the community. I think people have done an amazing job sheltering in place, very high adherence to the use of masks. We have very low transmission rates in Berkeley. We have very low infection rates. We should be incredibly proud of the work that this community has done, not just government. And I do applaud the, the efforts of the city because I think our health officer and our city employees have done a, a, just an outstanding job keeping us safe but also all members of the community who have really had goodwill and done very difficult things, sheltering in place, risking their businesses, risking their livelihoods for the benefit of all. So we are a very rule-bound, compliant city, certainly as compared to other places in the United States. I have no doubt that we will get back into our very good habits around use of reusables and plastics and that once things have stabilized a little bit, people will be able to lay on the additional elements of, of the new ordinance as well. We'll get, we're gonna get there. Right. <laughs> I have a lot of faith in the people. Thank yeah. you for that faith and also thank you for your leadership, Sophie. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you for yes, joining us. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for your continued interest in this topic and for, and for bringing it to the forefront.
it is something we need to focus on. The, the imperative to reduce our footprint, our, our environmental footprint and our energy footprint remains. We're so lucky to have a council member who's so knowledgeable and passionate about um, this issue and who's really shown um, such leadership on it. Uh, we started working on that campaign to uh, reduce single-use disposable foodware in 2016, and um, council member Han was an incredible partner in that, um, really um, took the leadership on it, made, made sure that we consulted deeply with the community and with uh, businesses on what would work for them and came out with an ordinance that is a model ordinance for the nation and really the world. Um, the first ordinance of its kind that really focuses on reducing disposable foodware as opposed to just switching from you know, styrofoam to a recyclable, quote unquote, plastic or a compostable. You know, it's really the whole thing is designed ultimately to reduce the total amount of disposable foodware that we're using. And that's really the direction that we need to go for all of these things, whether it's um, plastic bags or foodware or all the other kinds of disposable packaging uh, that we get. And you know, currently the industry really wants us to believe that all of that stuff is recyclable. And this ordinance and our state law and the polystyrene bans and others are really um, you know, sort of the first um, powerful wedge that we've gotten to be able to counter that argument that number one, the stuff's all recyclable, and number two, that there aren't viable uh, solutions out there that in many cases are just inconvenient or are um, more cost effective. Actually, Martin, this might be a good time to remind people about the situation that really inspired us to do our presentation last year, which was the lack of knowledge about what was recyclable and what was not, specifically about plastics. So there was a wonderful film that a year ago was just about in the finishing stages called The Story of Plastic. And I'd like to show you a clip there. It actually features Martin and our local recycling center, and it will just give you a visual, visceral sense of this problem. Plastics are treated as a product that miraculously appears from nowhere, and it goes to nowhere. It starts when the oil and the gas leave the wellhead, and it keeps on being a problem at every stage along the way. Why is it that we're seeing so much more plastics entering the environment? This is the story of plastics. We got into recycling because we thought it was the right thing to do. Of course, it is a disposal service. You know, at its core, it's taking stuff that people don't want anymore and, and trying to do something better than landfill with it. In 2013, under significant pressure from our city council, um, we began accepting um, non-bottle mixed rigid plastic. So all the plastic containers, berry containers, keg cups, plastic cold cups, you know, from Starbucks. Procter & Gamble wants us all to believe that all their packaged goods are in, you know, totally environmentally sound packaging. You know, they want us all using single-use packaged products so that we're just, you know, on the supply chain. It's totally unfair to the cities and the recyclers on the back end because then everyone says, oh, it's recyclable, it's recycle-ready, you should collect it. Well, then what? The United States was shipping over 50% of its plastics and its papers to China. The situation was very similar in Europe. We were just shipping it all to China. China will deal with it. And we built up these big recycling programs and everything was about recycle. Recycle, recycle, recycle is, is the solution to everything because we had China there. So China's just said, you know what? We're sick of being a dumping ground and we don't want this stuff introduced into our country. I see the China thing as a, as a reckoning because it's all been this false market where we've just been shipping stuff to China. This is, in my 25-year career, this is the biggest recycling crisis globally that we have ever seen. 
Now at the same time the tons are going up and up and up, the price is going down and down and down and down to the point where now it's costing us 50 bucks a ton to get rid of. If you think we're just gonna take it from China and ship it to Thailand or Indonesia or Vietnam, where is it gonna go? When the government shut down the recycling center, most people shift to like more remote or hidden villages or other countries. From, from US. This is uh, Nestle? From UK? Yeah, it's from Australia. This came from Toronto. Toronto. Dunking Donut. It's from Oregon. From yeah, New Zealand. Divana. Ya, awalnya kita memang uh, merasa plastik ini sesuatu yang uh, bagus ya. Jadi ini praktis begitu. Kemudian orang, tapi kemudian terakhir kita bisa melihat bagaimana plastik itu berubah menjadi sebuah uh, bencana bagi kita karena The Story of Plastic is an amazing film. I hope everyone gets to see it in its full length. It's a 90 minute Uh, documentary. Um, you can find it at thestoryofplastic.org uh, or go to the Story of Stuff uh, website. Story of Stuff is a Berkeley-based organization with national and international linkages. Great film and you can um, schedule a screening of your own for your own community. So I encourage you to help spread the word about that amazing uh, film. What it shows so well, in my opinion, is that this is a systemic problem and it's one that's been created by the plastics industry. It's not a consumer problem. It's not our fault that all this plastic exists in the world. And it's really a fool's errand for us to be trying to keep it all contained or to try and recycle it all. It's really not a viable solution. And for decades, um, the plastic industry, the American Chemistry Council and others profiled in the film, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars marketing the recyclability of plastics to the American people and really pressed cities around the country, including those right here in the Bay, um, to collect all plastics. That was the name of one of their marketing campaigns where they marketed directly to the managers, recycling managers um, in cities to get them to collect all the plastic. And their argument was if you collect it all, then the um, number one bottles and number two bottles that actually have markets, you'll get more of that and then the rest of the stuff, um, you know, eventually there will be a market for it. Well, that hasn't panned out at all. And so now here we are, you know, a decade later, we're collecting all this stuff, or in some cases, two decades later, we've been collecting all this stuff. And for years we were shipping it overseas, but now we know uh, without a, a doubt that, you know, what was happening overseas was, was an atrocity and was really horrific. And so now we're stuck with all this non-recyclable or very low-grade plastics. And here in Berkeley, what we do with that stuff now is, um, and these are the non-bottle plastics. So uh, number one and number two plastics are pretty, um, they have pretty stable markets. But basically everything else that we collect in the program is mixed together and sent to a, f a facility in Southern California. And at that location, they have optical sorters and robots and Um, artificial intelligence um, at great expense, working 24-7 um, to separate all this stuff out. And even with all of that high-tech equipment and uh, at a cost of about $75 per ton, they can only capture about half of what we send them for uh, recycling and for marketing. The other half goes to a landfill in Southern California. So here we are spending all the effort at home to separate it and then Uh, back at the recycling yard, we separate it, and then it gets sent to another facility where uh, machines separate it, and then still half of it's going to landfill. So at some point, we have to ask ourselves, you know, really look at it and say, is it recyclable? Is this 
worth including in our program. And uh, as somebody who wants to keep things out of landfill, and our whole goal around zero waste is reducing the amount of uh, waste to landfill, um, it's hard to say I'd rather send it to the landfill. When I look at this full equation of, of these non-bottle plastic containers, we really have to say it's not recyclable, and we really have to go upstream them and demand that the, um, the plastics industry and the packagers and the major brands and um, the retailers um, find other solutions. You know, there are better solutions out there, and we don't have to uh, assume that plastic is uh, the best or the only way for us to go. So on that note, let me ask you a couple of questions, Martin. You said pretty much it needs to be a bottle to be recycled. Um, I'm going to just give you a few other examples, something like that. Does that is that recyclable? I would have to double check, but that looks like a clear PET number one bottle. And PET is the most recyclable plastic in, in bottle form, is the most uh, marketable, most likelihood of being made into something mm -hmm. again. Most of it gets made into fiber, which is used for carpeting and clothing, mm -hmm. furniture coverings and battings um, for furniture. And it, increasingly, we're getting bottle to bottle recycling where some of the major bottlers are feeling the pressure from consumers to increase the recycled content of their bottles. Wow. And so we're starting to see some food grade recycled PET now go back into bottle to bottle recycling. Mm -hmm. But most of it gets made into things that will be used for a longer period of time and then eventually go to landfill. So I can probably answer my own question that things like this, which are colored, not really bottle shaped, this is, should really go in the garbage. A few things to keep in mind, size is important in recycling programs. Um, if it's smaller than your fist, it's probably gonna fall through a lot of equipment, um, hard to capture for lots of programs, including ours. If it's smaller than your fist, it's probably not recyclable. Um, may end up in our outthrows for um, you know the pill bottles and vitamin bottles that Arlene just showed us. Um, those will probably fall into that category. Colored plastic for the clear PET colored plastic is also considered a contaminant to the clear plastic. Some brands like to distinguish themselves on the shelf by, on the shelf by having a green plastic drinking bottle or a blue plastic water bottle. Those would be um, considered contaminants for the clear plastic, which is the you know, major category. So I want to show you, Martin, one of the other very common forms of packaging, which is sort of my ne nemesis, the clamshell. Uh, you said earlier a comment last, last year, actually, about wish cycling. And I think this is the sort of item that a lot of us wish cycle. We wish there were a way to recycle this, but in fact, it's garbage. But this is the alternative that so many people face when they go to the grocery store or sometimes even to the farmer's market. So I want to share a story with you. These just came from the farmer's market yesterday. This lovely collection of heirloom tomatoes in a nicely compostable container. I had that choice or I could have gotten ones even at the farmer's market in a clamshell. But the worst was the strawberries because my Plastic Free July last year was to not buy strawberries in anything in, that was plastic. That is a challenge, truly. Now, there are a couple of kinds of plastic. There are these, which a lot of berries come in, but at least I can take those back, cleaned, to farmers. This a better alternative, which is cardboard. But I, this Sunday, in fact, had the choice of going to my normal strawberry vendor. I go there almost every Sunday, and I buy a three pack of strawberries. And this time, they were in clamshells. And I said, sir, why is this? And he said, oh, it's, I'm, I'm giving people an alternative. I said, I don't like this alternative. Why, it's more plastic, why are you doing this? And then he kind of took his head down. He said, well, it, it's easier for us. It's, they don't, the berries don't fall out. And last year I learned the other thing, which is the open baskets at, the, at some markets before the pandemic. People were helping themselves. Monterey Market described 30% of their strawberries disappearing as people took samples. So our bad behavior 
has created a bad practice on the part of growers. So much better to buy them in cardboard that can be composted. They're open, they're beautiful, you get to see them, not behind plastic. One of the other changes that I made in my own routine was about wipes. Over the world, there are millions of wipe products, facial wipes, baby wipes, butt wipes, you name it, that unfortunately land in landfill, and they are mostly plastic, unless it specifically says 100% plant-based, don't buy it. That was one of my Plastic Free July choices that I encourage you just to consider. So again, kind of audit your lives to just analyze how much plastic is there and how much you might be able to do without. One of the other changes I'll just mention that I made from last year, I looked at the pictures of our event and I was wearing an outfit I really love, locally sourced, but it was synthetic and now we're learning more about that. So I made a choice today to wear a simple 100% organic cotton top and a scarf that is repurposed from kimono fabric. So whenever you can follow those R's, refuse, refusing plastic, recycle, reuse, repurpose, and try to have a life cycle of products that is round as opposed to something you buy and dispose of quickly. It's better for you, it's better for our planet. But let me take a moment now just to give another form of context. We're here at the club at a time when most people are sheltering in place as a result of this pandemic. Over 125,000 souls have been lost just in these United States, over 500,000 worldwide. So we recognize that reducing our use of plastic, especially single-use plastic, may not be everyone's highest priority. And certainly the health and safety of our community must be that. But if you have the emotional and the financial resources to make choices, we want to encourage you to do that. So let me just share with you my plastic-free basket of plastic-free goodies. These are alternatives that you can make. And I would urge each of you as part of the Plastic Free July Challenge to consider things that you use in a normal part of your life and see if there are alternatives that are less plastic intense. So, for example, um, th this is a little bit different. These are reusable paper towels. They're not really paper, they're bamboo. And they can be used many, many times. This is more in the line of if it's more durable, if it's higher quality, if you can use things multiple times, encourage you to do that. This is a, a product that, in fact, I got at the Ecology Center. And I want to encourage you to use the Ecology Center store, especially when it is, is reopened. These are bags that you can take with you to markets, farmers markets, now that we're allowed to, um, that are breathable. I have a whole collection in various shapes and sizes. Um, it also make a lovely present. One of my favorite plastic alternatives are beeswax wraps. Numerous brands. Um, this is one that I've used many, many, many times. It shapes with the warmth of your hand. Super for wrapping bread, um, cheeses, meats, washable. Many, many times you can use it. This is what it looks like, fresh and then it becomes malleable over time. A really wonderful alternative to plastic wrap. So in the kitchen, that is where you're gonna find a lot of plastic alternatives. A main overriding concept that I wanna share with you though is going back to soap. Since this pandemic, soap has certainly become our friend. This is actually my shampoo. And I try to use soap in bar form, I do have it in here, in whenever I can. It's also pretty. I use bar soap for laundry, for shampoo, for conditioner, and for doing dishes. Whenever you buy a bottle, mostly a plastic bottle, 
and it's a liquid cleanser, you are buying very expensive water. And it has to be transported, and it's heavy. So just think about revising your, your thinking a little bit in terms of drier products and packaged in something that's compostable. There are lots of alternatives. If you think about what you, beauty products, personal care products, every toothbrush that was plastic, and almost all of them are, that you've ever used in your lifetime, and the toothpaste tube is still on this planet. They simply don't biodegrade, ever. They go in landfill, and they are there way past our lifetime. There are alternatives. This is one mint toothpaste. It comes with a little scoop. It is coconut oil based with peppermint oil. I like it a lot. Actually, my favorite form of toothpaste, this is actually just a little paper bag of small pellets. Looks like a little pill, smaller than an Altoid, less strong than an Altoid. And these are wonderful for toothpaste. And then I use a toothbrush that I bought at the Ecology Center that is made of bamboo with charcoal bristles. So the main message is wherever you can, look for plastic alternatives. And I think you'll be surprised that there are lots. I just watched a TED Talk, a woman in Britain who almost single-handedly changed the industry on what they call cotton buds. Most Americans would call them by the brand name of Q-tip. But there, she found millions of plastic sticks that came from cotton buds along the shores in Great Britain and went on a major campaign. And over several years, starting in 2007, they banned plastic sticks on cotton buds. The sort of thing, whenever you're looking for a new product, Try to buy the one that is not plastic, if possible. Another alternative, um, again, brand label, uh, Band-Aid, plasters, bandages. They can be fabric as opposed to plastic. The choice is yours. Also, the packaging. This is an old package I've kept on. It's metal. It'll last a long time and is reusable. So just urge you to think in that way as you sort of audit your lives of how you can make smart choices and also make smart choices about where you purchase products. Of all times now, it is so important to support our local businesses. They, they need us all very badly to stay in business. So shop local, shop long term. Buy for quality as opposed to the convenience, single purpose, plastic represents. Thank you so much, Arlene. Um, Arlene's an amazing champion of the Ecology Center and a regular shopper uh, <laughs> at our store. We are open currently for curbside pickup. You can uh, check out an assortment of products that we have available uh, during this time uh, at our Ecology Center website, ecologycenter.org slash store, um, and you'll find a selection of products there, particularly um, for cleaning and, and household products. But we have a, a wide selection of stuff there, and the idea is that we try and help individuals um, take an individual approach to this problem. We know that it's a systemic problem. We know that it's driven by the fossil fuel industry and by the um, chemistry, the American Chemistry Council and the plastics industry. Um, but there are individual things that we can do, and voting with our pocketbook and through the purchasing decisions that we make does, does have an impact. During Plastic Free July, the goal ultimately is that you would go 100% plastic free for a whole month. And we know that that is a big ask and a very difficult thing to achieve in this day and age. But what I like to do and what I recommend that my friends and colleagues do and what I'm asking you to do is pick one thing that you feel you could make a change in your life or in your family's life around your practices and um, something that you could stick with for the whole month and hopefully be able to carry on beyond that. So if you buy a lot of bottled water, a very easy transition is to a reusable drinking water uh, bottle. Our available 
brought widely and they um, pay for themselves pretty quickly. When you um, do the math, it turns out we often pay more for bottled water than we do for gasoline. And the quality of it is not necessarily any better. Uh, in fact, here in the East Bay, we have some of the best water in the world that comes straight from the Sierras and it's delicious and it's cheap. So why should we waste our money on something that's been bottled elsewhere? We don't even know the quality of it. So just pick one thing that you could do. Um, if there's a, a product in our store that can help you do that, great. Um, it may be something else that's very simple, like, okay, I really am just going to use my reusable bags, or I um, am going to uh, stop uh, buying uh, so much produce in the clamshells that Ar Arlene was pointing out, those um, plastic containers. And just briefly, you know, the reason those containers are problematic, they're made out of the same plastic, PET, as the drinking bottles are, but they're made in a different way. So the chemical additives that are put into them, mixed into them, are not compatible with bottles. And so bottles are, are made through a process called blow molding, where they blow up the plastic and heat it. And those clamshells are made through thermoforms, which are basically pressed and heated at the same time. And you, you need difficult, different chemical properties to do that. The additives in the clamshells make them hard to recycle. So there aren't good markets for the, the, those thermoform clamshells. And those are one of the things that uh, we ship down to Southern California for sorting and um, are problematic uh, materials. So, you know, pick one thing that you could do and uh, try it out for the month of July. As Martin mentioned, just pick one thing. As I, I had said, my th one thing last year was strawberries. And I have stayed pretty true to that. Sometimes even I slip. But ask yourself the question as you look at a product that's in plastic, is there an alternative? And if there isn't, do I really need it this week? Maybe next week there will be an alternative that is open packaged, or I can go somewhere else. Now, we all recognize that right now there are many people who are of necessity getting groceries delivered, and that has really added, frankly, more packaging and fewer alternatives. And, and we recognize, again, health and safety must come first. But when you can, and long term, if you can build this into your life. The other thing I would encourage people to do is, as Martin said, the, I can't imagine buying bottled water. I haven't, maybe ever. But it's so easy to carry various kinds of containers, and they're healthier. And one simple container, you don't even have to go out and buy one, probably. I have one on the table here, is an old-fashioned bell jar. Glass jar, I use them for canning. Um, which I've gotten back into in this pandemic, but very classic, old-style, durable item that you can, when allowed, also take to your grocery store for bulk purchasing. And that's another simple change you can make, is instead of buying, for example, another one that I, I use for Plastic Free July that stayed with me, purchasing of nuts and granola. So often, if you buy them at one of our favorite stores that has the initials TJ, um, you will buy things in a half pound or a pound container in a plastic satchel. But you can buy those things in bulk. Understandably, some of the bulk bins were closed during the pandemic. Those, that won't last forever. Get back into the habit of bringing your own container, whether it's a bell jar, a satchel, your own bag, a bag that you reuse, at least it's not single use. And that's mostly what we want to get away from. One of the real areas of opportunity for reducing plastic, especially single use, is in containers for drinks. And in our area, of course, we're all a real coffee culture. A couple of things we can mention here, too, is you can now bring your own vessel, your own cup, but the law is clear that the barista cannot fill it. There are ways around that, and I'm going to ask you, Martin, if you can talk a little bit about the program here in Berkeley uh, called Vessel. Yeah, so last year we partnered with a Boulder-based company called Vessel. It's a reusable cup service 
where you sign up and you can check out a reusable cup. You then take that cup with you, and then when you're done with it, you return it to any of the participating restaurants um, or cafes. And so we launched that around the Berkeley campus. We had five cafes on campus and six off campus. And we're really looking to expand that this spring um, with all of the closures and the university being closed, Vessel is on pause for the, for the moment, but they're getting ready to relaunch in Berkeley uh, when the cafes reopen. And they're also planning a significant launch in San Francisco. Um, so it's a pretty exciting uh, sort of test program to see if customers will use it um, to work through some of the issues. Is the cup in front of the counter or behind the counter? They, they made some switches initially um, so that all the cups were behind the counter. Vessel collects all those cups, takes them back to a central location, washes and sanitizes them, puts them in sanitized um, delivery containers, and then delivers them back to the cafes um, where the barista would then check them out to you. So uh, that's how uh, Vessel works. We're looking forward to them coming back as soon as possible. With regards to reusable cups, the new uh, language in Berkeley's order and um, in many of the counties around us is that you can bring your own container, you can bring your own cup, you can't put it on any surface. So we've seen some leadership from this in other countries. Australia has a program where you hold the cup and the barista pours coffee for you. That's pretty straightforward for black coffee, but maybe a little more complicated for a, a, a complex uh, espresso drink. But you can also use them uh, at a fountain drink, which, you know, for cold beverages. And that's actually where two thirds of the cups in the country get used, disposable cups in the country get used, are those waxed paper um, soda cups that are used um, at the self-service fountains. And you can use a reusable cup for cold service as well as for hot. Um, Berkeley's ordinance that was passed in 2019 requires a 25 cent charge on all disposable cups, hot and cold, paper or plastic. Um, all the cups should be compostable. And while we really wanna support the small businesses as they reopen, and we know this is not their top priority, they have a lot on their minds right now, gentle encouragement and support from the customer base, reminding them that these should be compostable um, is certainly appropriate. Again, we don't wanna come at them really um, hard because they're dealing with so many things. But uh, as Sophie's mentioned, uh, we feel in, you know, over the course of time, we will get uh, you know, much higher compliance and, and uh, agreement with that. Many of our businesses are already doing amazing things and coming up with great innovation on how to reduce disposables uh, even in this uh, difficult time. Anna asks, is silicone better to buy and use than plastic? So I just want to show you, I'm assuming she's talking about something like this. Um, if you can see, there we go. Um, so stasher bags uh, were actually originally a locally produced product and were uh, originally available. They're a, a, a thick, they're a lovely product. They're good for, especially for, say, freezing. But um, I'll, Martin, I'll let you address the reason that things a little bit have changed. Thanks everybody for hanging with us tonight. On the Stasher bags, Stasher is a woman owned business that started here in the East Bay, um, B Corporation, uh, really looking for an alternative for Ziploc bags and, and um, trying to solve the disposable single use bag issue. And they came up with a great solution. It's a silicon um, Ziploc bag. Our understanding is they recently were purchased by Johnson & Johnson. And um, while they maintain you know, business control of their brand and, and line, they now have the distribution uh, of major consumer packaged goods company behind them. So um, you can find them now at Target and other major retailers, and they've got um, distribution around the country. We love the small, local, woman-owned, you know, a lot of women innovators in this business space right now. In fact, most of the reusable and zero waste products that I see coming out are being created by um, young women innovating in this space is very exciting. But, you know, when they get picked up by a major brand or um, conglomerate like Johnson & Johnson, uh, the reach is going to be so much greater. And so you kind of, you know, balance this local, privately owned, 
small versus you know really reaching scale and so um, we chose not to continue to carry them at the ecology center that's just you know we don't carry johnson and johnson brands of a lot of reasons but <laughs> their corporate structure their toxic footprint lots of things right um, and Local all the other plastic product. they produce, <laughs> but right. we think it's great that their, you know, the stasher bag is now available much more broadly. We have um, a lot of other interesting um, solutions like stasher at home. I mean, at our uh, store, you know, I would say from like, which is better plastic or silicone um, from a health perspective, uh, we always turn to environmental working group. They have great, um, they do a lot of testing and we, really trust them in their science. They find that their studies are that most of the plastics we use uh, release different kinds of toxins and their um, additives that are put into the plastic to make them flexible or to make them rigid or to make them um, be able to take certain forms. Um, those plastics do leach out into the water or into um, your food. And so uh, just on that front, the silicon at this point, what we hear from environmental working group is that silicon is a better alternative. They still don't recommend microwaving in it um, and heat, you know, heating your food in it, but they haven't also said, here's the problem with that. So it's more of kind of the cautionary side. Just from a health perspective, I per personally feel much safer with um, silicon as a food contact surface than any of the plastics that, that you might get from you know packaged food. And of course the ultimate answer to the question about buying a a package, something to store things in, the right answer may be the thing you already own. For example, you know, these jars like this with a really super uh, lid on them, you can just replace the the seal, those are terrific. Or just the old fashioned bell jar that is so useful for so many things, including, as I mentioned earlier, taking things to the grocery store to fill up with bulk. So if you don't have to buy a new container, that's probably the best answer still. There's some really exciting stuff in that space. Um, you know, when you take a container to the bulk section, you have to weigh it, get an initial weight, then you fill it with whatever you're gonna fill it with, then you get a second weight, and then they take the difference, you know, there's a tear weight and a second weight and they take the difference and then they charge you, you know, by the pound for that. There's now some cool um, products coming out, jars that have the tear weight um, on them. Oh, great. So they're pre-weighed. That's kind of cool. That's nice. Um, and they're starting to develop ones that have barcodes on them so that um, they can integrate with the point of sale. So you don't have to go through that whole first weighing. They can just you know, know what the weight of that jar is. So some exciting developments in, in that kind of bulk purchasing space. Second question is from Claire who asks, how to remember not to buy plastic? And she put that in, in all in caps. I am so used to it. I sometimes pick up salad greens in a plastic clamshell because that's the way that the store sells it. I get home and ask myself why I thought I needed so many greens badly enough to use that big plastic shell help. I know I'm not alone. Claire, you are absolutely not alone. And I want to share with you my plastic-free July commitment from about three or four years ago when I suddenly realized my husband and I both like yogurt and I was buying about every week one of these tubs. And even though I washed it out and I reused it for leftovers or storing other things. I think this has got nuts in it right now. How many of these tubs can a couple use? I mean, over the course of a year, we were getting you know mountains of these things. And finally, it dawned on me, this is crazy. I used to make my own yogurt. Why don't I do that? So it prompted two things. One is I now always buy milk in glass. It's wonderful milk. If you have the option, I realize not everyone does, but this is Strauss Family Creamery. It is pasteurized, it is not homogenized, which means you get the cream at the top, which is really, really yummy. And then, you know, I make yogurt out of one of these every week. I do it in a very, very low tech way. So my, <laughs> I have one of these, which is water, and I have one of these, which is the milk and a little bit of yogurt from the last week. There's, you know, people say, oh, do you have a yogurt machine? No, what I have is a really old fashioned, thermos jug here, I wrap my bottles, hot water, the hot yogurt in a couple of towels. I used to put the towels over my old Wedgwood stove. 
um, if you have a pilot light, or even just a um, le little electric heating pad. You, very low tech, it's very simple. Yogurt's extremely forgiving. So I think the message to Claire is this, to be mindful. We, we ask in the presentation that question about paper or plastic. I'd urge you to ask another question that, and just keep it with you, especially during the month of July. Plastic or planet? And if you just keep that question front of mind, when you're searching through the store, when you're looking for products that, especially ones that you might use every week, every month, those are the ones that will make a difference if you swap them out. So if we look at the next slide, I have just a quick summary of some of those choices that are, are there to be made. Reusing things whenever you can, repurposing things, using concentrates in dry form rather than liquid form, bulk when you're allowed to. Um, the other thing is individually packaged. If you can avoid things that come in little individual wrappers, whether it be a, a comestible product or a personal hygiene product. Obviously bringing your own containers, we talked a lot about that to restaurants when you can. Uh, avoiding plastic garbage bags if possible. And whenever you can be a leader in choosing plastic alternatives, either by gifting or showing your friends that that's what you're doing, that's also a, a wonderful statement. These are some of alternatives. Obviously, I put top of the list is the Ecology Center and their store. They also turned me on to feelgood.co, which is on San Pablo. They're wonderful for taking your own containers and filling with things like cleaning products. They even have a deodorant in bulk, which you can, you can fill up. Um, another form factor to remember is cardboard versus plastic, if at all possible. And one I just learned about, the refill shop um, in Oakland. Check it, you can Google certainly refillable near me, and there are lots now of products that you'll be able to find uh, that, that will fill the bill. And, and just keep asking yourself, is there a way to buy this other than in plastic or maybe buy a different product? Third question um, is gonna be one for Martin. David asked a sort of meta question. If at any point I'm wondering if something is recyclable or not, how do I answer that? We do have a slide showing a new service that is resourcefulapp.com. It's actually not an app at this point. It is a website. Uh, Martin, you want to talk about Resource? We're very excited about to, to launch Resourceful um, for, for Berkeley. It's been a labor of love with our staff and a local um, tech engineer developer. And we found that um, most people when trying to find solutions for getting rid of stuff at home, look on the desktop rather than on their mobile phone. So it is called resourcefulapp.com. It, it, it's a web-based app. It lives on a website. We have a link on our homepage and our recycling page. It's very cool. It's very visual and very graphic. And you can type in just about anything you want to get rid of and find out where, um, you know, where you can do that locally. If you're making a major purchase and you're thinking about what's going to happen um, afterwards, <laughs> uh, you can also look up and, and find out sort of end of life for um, appliances and mattresses and, you know, all, all kinds of things that you can um, find in here. So um, just wanted to, you know, encourage you when you're thinking about what can I do with this other than send it to landfill, check out resourcefulapp.com or go to our website, Ecology Center org and, and uh, follow the links from our homepage. And I notice beyond the one for Berkeley, there's one also for Oakland and for San Francisco. Yeah, uh, not as in depth uh, as the Berkeley one because we, our staff um, amazingly went through hundreds of items. And so we have a lot more depth for Berkeley. Um, right. Obviously, many of those resources would apply, you know, to the East Bay that are sort of regional. So it would apply to Oakland as well, I would assume. All right, thanks so much. So we've gotten several questions in the chat about plastic bags. 
what happens to them, where do they go after they're left in places like big containers at Safeway, although in fact most of the Safeway stores have stopped doing that during the pandemic, or at Trader Joe's. There is still one Trader Joe's store locally, the Rockridge one, does have a little green shack that uh, continues to accept those plastic bags. People were asking, some have been told they're turned into roads or, or lumber. Um, Martin, do you want to address, to the, to the best of your knowledge, what does happen to those if they get collected? I think it's helpful for people to understand sort of the behind, you know, behind the magic curtain, like what's, what's really going on. Um, so just the backstory, bag reduction was voluntary. If you sold bags, the law in California was if you sold bags at a major retailer, you had to take them back. So it was a take back program at, at grocery stores. And, you know, that was okay because it kept it out of the recycling programs uh, at curbside where it would wrap up in all the machinery and, and screw everything up. But, you know, they really didn't get that much volume. Um, when it comes back from consumers, a lot of times it has food contamination in it. You've got the clear ones. You, uh, you've got colored ones, you've got a blue one from the New York Times and a green one from another paper and uh, your produce bag and your carryout bag and the bag you got from, you know, some pharmacy. Or, and so, you know, when all those different things are mixed together, it's hard to make anything out of them. Supermarkets, you know, they get a lot of their if large retailers, they get a lot of their product on pallets, wooden pallets with crates or boxes stacked on them. And then that whole thing is wrapped in shrink wrap, uh, not shrink wrap, like saran wrap. And that film is actually pretty highly recyclable. And on the back end, it doesn't get contaminated. It's pretty clean. And for a long time, um, and in, you know, in, in many places, that has had a decent market for um, typically making plastic lumber. Uh, you know, park benches and the like. So it's a down cycling strategy. It, you know, it goes from a short cycle to a longer durable life and then to landfill, um, you know, maybe save some lumber from park benches that might otherwise be, um, you know, cut in the Pacific Northwest or something. When they have enough volume of that stuff, the good clean wrap um, that the markets want to buy because it's pretty high grade and it's pretty clean and it's pretty uniform, they can blend in the consumer stuff, upgrade the consumer phase, you know, the post-consumer stuff with their industrial grade scrap and still sell it. And that was really um, quite possible until the China ban, um, you know, went into effect in 2017, 2018. A lot of that was getting exported to China. Um, those markets are gone. They don't exist anymore. And for the ones that do exist domestically, um, you know, there's only a couple on the West Coast. So otherwise you're shipping to the East Coast. And when you ship to the East Coast, you're putting it in a truck and you're having to compete for transportation with cell phones and televisions. You know, guess which has the higher markup. So um, always cheaper to ship uh, from the West Coast to Asia than it is to ship from the West Coast to the East Coast of the US. So it gets upside down price-wise pretty fast because of the transportation. And now also those markets are just saying, hey, if it's not clean, we don't want it, period. It goes supermarket by supermarket in terms of what, and region by region, in terms of can they find a market for it? Can they blend it in with their other stuff? They are currently not required to take it um, at the state, lot, state level anymore. At this point, I would say pretty much Plastic bags are, um, your best strategy is reuse. Keep using them over and over and over until they get holes in them or whatever and then throw them in the garbage, um, you know, is, is probably the most consistent solution. Those markets may come back eventually, but right now and in the foreseeable future, it's super spotty. Joan had a question. We're told that milk cartons can be composted so I do that rather than buy milk in glass, which is more expensive. Is that true or should I really be buying milk in glass? Cartons are covered in polypropylene. Um, so it's plastic coated paper. Uh, the paper will compost, compost. The plastic becomes what they call uh, in the industry, a jellyfish. It becomes this amorphous film and that gets sorted out. Um, but not before it releases lots of tiny little bits of fragments and microplastic into the compost. So even though the compost program allows you to put it in there, 
I would encourage you to put cartons in the garbage. The other option is plastic jugs. Um, milk has a fairly high fat content. Fat attracts some of the chemicals that are in plastic and holds on to them. Um, and so from a health perspective, glass is definitely the safest place to be. Um, we know, you know, Strauss is really the only one doing it that, that I know of in glass and um, is some amazing milk. It's, you know, local and it, delicious, delicious and, you know, stays really fresh in those cold glass jars as well. Um, but it is a lot more expensive. So, you know, this is kind of your, you know, the, the tough choices that we make. Um, right. I, I will say in defense, when I buy, especially when I buy a half gallon of the milk, then I use half of it to make yogurt. And the yogurt I make is actually less expensive than the yogurt I would buy in a glass jar from Saint Benoit or something like that. But the main point and the reason I really like to make it is that I know exactly what's in my yogurt. Milk, yogurt, that's it. No sugar, no carrageenan, no guar gum and all things that I can't pronounce. So. It's just yogurt, and it's definitely the healthiest. It's completely organic. But there are a couple of last questions that are sort of segue into what I hope will be a next presentation. How do we stop all the plastic manufacturing? Now, that, you know, that's not a question that either Martin or I can answer in a few minutes, but the fact that we're asking it is the important one. My advice to you is to be a friendly advocate for change. And only if we put pressure on manufacturers are they going to change. There are multiple levels at which you can do this at your local businesses. If they don't carry bulk products, ask for them to. If they're, if they're plastic alternatives that you would like to see carried more generally, um, I haven't mentioned, but in fact, just in the last year since we did the first presentation, at Berkeley Bowl, there are many more plastic alternatives, like the shampoo and the conditioner that I used to have to get directly from the manufacturer up in Sonoma County. They now carry it. And they have a big aisle of bar products, things packaged in cardboard. Someone else asked about, what do we do about all of the plastic packaging on produce at, at Trader Joe's? Well, I will say, in fact, that they have come quite a long way in improving from where they were, where everything was under plastic, and now at least most of the stores have some vegetables and fruits that are available in bulk. But the answer is, speak up. Um, there's actually, on change.org, and I have it on this slide, there are petitions to many ma major companies, including Trader Joe's, and the big one, of course, is Amazon. Amazon right now, especially in the pandemic, is taking over our world in terms of the volume of consumerism. So write to them. Write to any company that has a product that you regularly use and enjoy and you'd like to see a change in packaging. I just called today to Toms of Maine. I was saddened to hear that they too are part of a major corporation now. But I am going to be writing them and leaving on their voicemail, yes, please, package your deodorant in cardboard. Other people are and can. Um, I point you also to some wonderful websites that have great information. PlasticPollutionCoalition.org has just tremendous information about what you as consumers can do. Um, same with UpstreamSolutions.org. Break Free from Plastics These have a tremendous amount of information where you can lobby as a consumer. And also you vote, as, as Martin said, you vote with your pocketbook, but you also vote truly in November. Earth Day this year, which was the 50th anniversary, as it is the 50th anniversary of the Ecology Center this year, their number one recommendation to consumers was to vote. That that is the single biggest important thing you can do in support of the environment. Um, really, the concept of, of recycling, we've thought that recycling would be the approach. But as you said, if, if your bathtub was overflowing, the first thing you would not do is reach for a mop. You would turn it off. And we've got to turn off the tap of single-use plastics. This is sort of the advanced course 
if all of you have, have already really gotten used to buying plastic free and have audited your lives and want to learn what more you can do or worry about, um, I highly recommend, it's an 84 page report on plastic and health. This will be something that we will uh, look to to include in a, in a final presentation on, on microplastics. So Martin, would you like any further words before we uh, close out? The consumer revolt and, you know, against plastic is, is in full effect. Um, I would just say Twitter is a great, great place for that. They're surprisingly <laughs> sensitive to their Twitter feed. So if you're on Twitter, light them up. California is against waste and is a good place to look for current legislation at the state level. There are um, some very important legislation, things that we never thought or expected would ever be considered by a state government. There's also national legislation, the Break Free from Plastic Act, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Amazing piece of legislation includes a national bottle bill, extended producer responsibility, export moratoriums, limits on expansion of the petrochemical industry. It's not going to get anywhere with a Republican Senate, so that's got to change. But um, the fact that it's even being discussed at the national level is quite amazing. And keeping the pressure on letting people in Washington know that we care is important. And then there's international stuff going on too. I'll turn it over to Martin to see if you have any final comments before we say good evening. So I'd like to thank the many members of the Ecology Center who might be viewing us uh, tonight and Arlene for being such a supporter uh, of the Ecology Center. Your uh, individual memberships and donations are really helping us out right now. And for those of you who aren't members, we would really love for you to join us at the Ecology Center, uh, which you can do by going to our website, uh, ecologycenter.org slash donate. Um, make a contribution, whatever you can. It's a very difficult time for us and other nonprofits. Our ability to innovate and to continue to speak the truth about things like recycling that you don't hear from other places uh, is largely due to our, our base of members like you. We are your recycler here in, in Berkeley uh, for Berkeley residents, and we think recycling is still really important. Um, paper, cardboard, cans, bottles, these things are highly recyclable. And so you'll, you know, you've been hearing a lot of critique or you've been hearing a lot of things that recycling is broken or doesn't work, and we want to reassure you that it's still really important to continue to recycle those things. Um, with all the new cardboard that we're using for shipping and online purchasing, you know, we really want to recycle that material rather than chewing up, you know, tropical forests to create cardboard. It's still really very important that you continue to separate your recyclables, keep them clean, uh, and keep them coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for all of your great information and inspiration and for all of the good work that the Ecology Center does. I want to thank the Ecology Center as well as the Bridge Association of Realtors. I am a Realtor and also the chair of the Climate Action Committee there, and I thank them for their support and publicity. So I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening for this presentation on plastic and the pandemic. I know this is a very, very challenging time with a lot on all of our minds, but we appreciate the time you've taken to consider these options this evening. We hope you stay healthy and go forward being kind to yourselves and to your neighbors. We wish you all a full heart and a good evening. <laughs>